There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through us all, and in us all. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. You notice in that particular passage, which is referring to the seven, what we call the seven ones, it begins with the phrase, there is one body. That's Ephesians 4 and verse 4. In chapter 1 and verses 22 and 23, we are informed by the same writer that the one body is the church. So if there is one body and the body is the church, there is only one church that God established. It is called the church of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, where Paul writes to the churches of God, or the church of God that is at Corinth. It is referred to as the churches of Christ, Romans 16 and 16. The churches of Christ salute you. It is referred to as the church of the firstborn. That is the assembly of the firstborn. That's Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 28. It is called the church of the Lord. The passage we heard in our hearing a moment ago, Acts 20, verse 28. These are simply terms of designation. They're not titles. They simply tell us to whom the church belongs. God, Christ, the firstborn, the church of the Lord. It refers to the fact that we are members of God's family. It's one church. We become members of that church by faith, repentance, and baptism. We are told specifically in so many words in Galatians 3 and 27 for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, did put on Christ. But notice the same process that puts us into Christ also is that which puts us into the body, the church. The passage is 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, where we are told specifically we're baptized into His body by the Spirit, that is taught by the Spirit, baptized into the body. So baptized into the body, the same thing as being baptized into Christ. The scriptures are exceedingly plain that there is only one church, and it's the church of the Lord. That's the only church of which I've ever become a member, the only church of which I'm interested in becoming a member, the church of our Lord. How is it the case, therefore, if that be the scripture's teaching, which is very plainly so, that the common doctrine currently is that the church makes no difference, that one can live a faithful Christian, die a faithful Christian, and never be a member of any church whatsoever at all. And that salvation is somehow an inward work of grace, and then later on we can join a particular church if we want to. But it's not requisite of us. I saved an article from the 1980s, and I was preaching in Arkansas, Northeast Arkansas at the time, and it was an article in which someone had written in the paper, and Billy Graham was answering. Billy Graham, the famous Baptist preacher, was answering the questions, and they said this, I've been a member, or I've been a rather a Christian for many, many years, but I've never been a member of any church. Which church shall I join? Well, what do you think Graham's answer was? What scripture could he point to to speak about which church one should join after he becomes a Christian? You can see immediately that the basis of the question, which is rife in the world, is really an unscriptural ground. It is based upon men's ideas that people become Christians separate and apart from any church relationship. Now, if that be so... I wonder why it is the case that so many people in differing churches work so hard in gaining members for their particular church, for it makes no difference whatsoever, according to their own doctrine, which church you belong to. Why work so hard to put members in a particular church if it makes no difference whatsoever, and one can be saved outside of a church relationship just as well as inside of it? How can that be the case? And why is it not the case also that the scene that we see in religion, represented by that question and answer by Graham, why is that not sinful? Our Lord prayed in John 17, verses 20 and 21, neither for these only, that is the apostles, do I pray, but for all of them who believe on me through their word, that they may be one, Father, even as thou art in me and I in thee, that the world may believe that that is in me. He prayed for unity. 
So if it is the case that I am coming along in my progression to become a Christian, and I become a Christian at point A, and then later I come to point B, and I will choose a particular church in which to place my membership in which to join, and then I have divided myself from others who call themselves Christians. Why is that not a sinful picture? Why is that not antagonistic to what our Lord prayed in John chapter 17? If I am exactly what God wants me to be, right here at point A, when I become a Christian, then why in the world would I want to join a particular sect, a denomination, and divide myself from others and why is that not antagonistic to the prayer of our Lord in John 17? Why is that not the case? The truth of the matter is, it is. And the common doctrine in religion today, not simply people who are non-churched, but people who are churched, so to speak, the common doctrine is that it makes no difference which church you might join, and that's the terminology they will use. Terminology which we do not find in the New Testament because the concepts upon which it is grounded are not found in the New Testament. But we want, what does the Bible teach? And so let's notice this morning the importance of the church, and we will even say it this way, the essentiality of the church. We need really in our minds to sweep away all of the ideas and the misconcepts that have attached themselves like barnacles on a ship and think about what does simply the New Testament teach. And it is very simple. We'll notice these following passages regarding the importance of the church. There are six of them, and I put them on the screen there so that you might see them, and you might write them down. You can look at them later. We will notice them briefly, but one of them will notice more at length, and that will be the number two passage, Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. So we'll look at that one more at length, and we'll look at that in just a moment. So let's notice these passages, and these are not the only, but these are six passages that show us the importance of the church. Number one is this statement right here in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, which is one among many parables in which our Lord shows us the importance of the church. And he likens the kingdom of heaven, that's the language here in verse 1, the kingdom of heaven to a vineyard. Now he tells us that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom, is the same as the church four chapters earlier in chapter 16. The church is the kingdom. That's chapter 16 and verse 18 of Matthew. Now here he tells us the kingdom of heaven is like unto a householder, that is one who owns a vineyard, a householder who goes out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he agrees with them for a shilling a day, he sends them into his vineyard. What is the vineyard? It's the church. He sends them into his church when he agrees with, for a shilling a day. Then he goes out at the third hour, and you remember the parable, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, he found some standing in the marketplace idle. He said, go back also into my vineyard. Whatsoever is right, I will give you. And finally, at the 11th hour, that would be 5 o'clock in the afternoon before 6 o'clock closing time, he goes out and finds others standing, sends them into his vineyard, and says, whatsoever is right, I will give you. And he gives them all a shilling a day. Now, here's the essential point that we need to glean, and that is that all of the work that is done is done in the Lord's vineyard. And that vineyard is the church. It seems to be a very far-fetched idea to suppose that people might be working in their own vineyard over here or a vineyard that they might establish over here and they would be paid the same as what the Lord pays to those who works in His vineyard. That would be a very strange idea, wouldn't it? Let's look at the second passage, Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 11 through 22. And we want to take a few moments with this one. In Ephesians 2, Paul is discussing here the church. As a matter of fact, in the first five chapters of Ephesians, there are only six of them, in these five chapters, he talks quite a bit about the church. And we want to look only today at chapter 2. And we'll come to chapter 3 in just a moment in very brief form. In chapter 2, verse 11 through 22, we can see this is a lengthy paragraph. And it is divided into three differing segments. Three segments in the paragraph. And it all involves the membership of non-Jews, Gentiles, into God's family, the church. So that's the topic of discussion. 
members of how the Gentiles become members of the family of God. And the first two, uh, two uh, verses, I started to say two sentences, but first two verses, which is verses 11 and 12, talks about what they were at one time, that is, what the Gentiles were at one time, that is, prior to. Now we come to verses 13 through 18, and we read what they are now. So prior they're outside, now they have access before they had access, now they have access to Christ, verses 13 to 18. And then we come to finally the household of God, verses 19 to 22. So that's how it goes. Now there are a couple of words, incidentally, that we need to note regarding the text that will help us along the way. And we'll note those words right now. Number one is the word reconciliation. The word reconciliation simply means taking two parties, or the idea that two parties at odds with one another now have become one. There are two different manners in which the word reconciliation is used in this text. One of them is the difference between God and man reconciled together, and primarily, however, in the text, how the word reconciliation is applied is between Jew and Gentile. They're brought together, Jew and Gentile, in one body. Now that's how the word reconciliation is hashed out in Ephesians chapter 2. You'll notice also that he speaks about, and I want you to notice the wording in verse 16. There is, he tells us, there's one body. And what, what does he say about that body? Then he also tells us in verse 19, speaks about the church. On other terms, he calls it the family of God or the household. This is the ASV from which I'm going to read. And it is the household of God. And then he has in verse 21, the temple of God. So those are three terms that we'll see that Paul uses to refer to the church. So let's pick up the read in Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll start at verse 11. So in this particular text, remember, it takes us all the way through verse 22. Wherefore remember that once ye the Gentiles in the flesh were called uncircumcision by those who were called circumcision, that you were at that time separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers of the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. All right, what was the status of non-Jews prior to Christ? The status was they're outside the covenants of the promise, having no hope without God. Outside. But now let's turn our attention to the next segment of this paragraph, verses 13 through 18. Now they have currently access. So I pick up the read in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you that once were afar off, that's Gentiles, are made nigh in the blood of Christ. For he, Christ, is our peace who made both one, that is Jew and Gentile. He made both one. And how did he make both one? How did he make Jew and Gentile one? The next line. He tells us, having broken down the middle wall of partition, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that's the Old Testament law, that he might create in himself of the two one new man, so making peace, and might reconcile them both in one body, there's the verse 16, in one body, under God through the cross, having slain the enmity, that's the law of Moses, thereby. And he came, verse, verse 17, this is Christ, he came and preached peace through the apostles, that is. He came and preached peace to you that were far off, peace to them that were nigh. For through him we both have, Jew and Gentile both, have our access unto God through the Spirit. All right, that is through the teaching of the Spirit. So let's notice what he has to say in this particular text. He tells us he's made both of them, Jew and Gentile, one in one body. What's the body? It's the church. He tells us that in chapter 4, Verse 4, either chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, where he tells us that the church is his body. And he made both Jew and Gentile one in the body of Christ. That's what we have in verse 16. Pretty simple, isn't it? Now let's notice his conclusion. And the conclusion is, fellow citizens of the saints or fellow members of the household, fellow members of the family, this is kind of interesting, and you'll notice it in much of Paul's writings. He uses the words, so then... And that's what he begins verse 19 with, isn't it? So then, that is, I'm going to conclude. I'm drawing a conclusion from what I've just stated. So then, you're no more strangers and sojourners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. 
What is the household of God? Some translations put family of God. Your fellow citizens, talking to Gentiles, non-Jews, your fellow citizens with the saints and of the family of God have been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. This is interesting. Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, that's uh, verse uh, 20, in whom each several building, fitly framed and knit together, grows unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also build it together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. So you saw the word one body, verse 16. You've seen also the household of God. Jew and Gentile are brought into the one household. That's the church. And he calls it also a temple in verse 21. The household is a family. So the question is, can one be a faithful Christian, can be a Christian at all, outside the family of God, the church? No. No, here's the family, it's the church. Can one be a Christian outside the body of Christ, which is the church? How can that possibly be? The ideas that spring these questions forward are based upon denominational misunderstandings regarding the church and the importance of it. Here he speaks about all of this is brought together, God's plan to bring it together in the church. And that's verse 16, verse 19, and verse 21. And it grows into a holy temple in the Lord, and the temple, the church, is where God's Spirit is. Simple, isn't it? So, is the church an important institution? Could you imagine coming to Paul and saying, well, you can be a Christian and not be a member of any church whatsoever. You would think, well, <clears throat> he would say, did you just read what I wrote? <laughs> Have you read anything that I've written? That would be the natural response, I would think, that Paul would give. And that's exactly the response I give to people today. Have we read what Paul has to say regarding the importance of the church? And the essentiality of it, that's the body of Christ, and people are brought together, Jew and Gentile, in the body, and presented unto God that way? How can we possibly fathom the idea that one can be a faithful Christian and not a part of that one church, the church of the New Testament? Let's go to the next one, and that's Acts 20 and verse 28. If we were to leave off, looking any passage, at any passage, that speaks about or underscores the importance, the essentiality of the church, this passage will do it right here. This was the only passage in the New Testament. So Paul's talking, same writer, this time he's giving an oral speech, and it's to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20. He's traveling through Ephesus, that's on the western coast of Asia, Turkey, and he's on his way back to Jerusalem for the last time. So he calls the elders together at a place called Miletus, just a town south of Ephesus, and he, tell, and he calls them together, and he makes a speech. And in this speech, here's what he says. To the elders, to the leaders of the congregation, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of the Lord, which he has purchased with his own blood. Can anyone rightly conclude from that comment that the church is an unimportant, take-it-or-leave-it institution that God simply will take someone in the church as well as out of the church. It's hard to fathom that that would be the case. As a matter of fact, we might link this with other passages, such as 1 John chapter 1 and 7, where we are told that if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, that's me with God, and His blood cleanses, continues to cleanse, that is, cleanses us from all sin. I have to walk in the light, and I'm cleansed by the blood of Christ if I continue to walk in the light of Christ. But that same blood is that which purchased the church, Acts 20, verse 28. Well, is that there are two different things here that we need to think about? No, it's one and the same, one and the same. Look at this passage, Ephesians, or this is Colossians, rather, 1, verses 12 and 13. Colossians 1. In this very short, terse sentence, Paul, the same writer, telling us regarding the kingdom of God. And he said, He delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Number one, we see the kingdom has already been established because he tells us he's been put into that kingdom. But the important point, the essential thing to grasp here is, according to Paul and his doctrine, there are only two realms in which we exist and possibly exist. 
You're either in the realm of Satan or you're in the kingdom of Christ. One of the two. There are not, there are not three different possibilities. There are only two. And we need to come out of the kingdom of darkness and be brought into the kingdom of the Son of His love. And who's the one who does it? Well, it's God who does that. And that's what He tells us. He translated us. Some translations said He transfers us from the kingdom of Satan, kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of the Son of His love, the kingdom of Christ. So who transfers us? Christ transfers us, or God transfers us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Isn't that exactly what we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 47? When they obeyed the gospel in Acts 2, by faith, repentance, baptism into Christ, God put them in the family. He added to the church such as should be saved. It was not a vote of membership. It was not a joining. It was not saying, I've been a Christian for many years. What church shall I join? It was when they obeyed the gospel, God put them in the church. The same language we read right here in Colossians 1. Transferred them out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. And there are only two places where we can be. The kingdom of Christ or the kingdom of Satan. That's plain, isn't it? Now that is hard. That's a hard doctrine. Not hard to read and understand, but it's hard to accept, isn't it? Because, because many people today, under the political correct ideas that we have, think that surely cannot be the case. But Paul is very simple in it. Now let's look at this one, Ephesians 3, 8 through 11. This is, once again in Ephesians, the passage we noted last week, and we'll only notice it for verse 11's sake here, where he begins, unto me whom less than the least of all saints, that's how he begins it. And he tells us that God planned to make all of this known, that is, planned to save men, through the church. And then he tells us, this church is according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. God made known the plan of salvation by the mouth of Paul and the apostles by means of the church, and that was according to God's eternal plan. How say some people that the church is of no importance or very little importance at all? According to this text, it is God's eternal plan plan to make known His will through the church. The church was a part of God's eternal plan. Let's look at one more passage, and that's 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. Speaking still of the importance, the essentiality of the church, Paul writing again tells us, telling the Corinthians, I espoused you to one husband, that I might present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So Paul's presenting himself here as the best man, bringing them to Christ, and the church is married to Christ. And that's why he tells us in Ephesians 5, speaks about the husband and the wife, and then he tells us this mystery is great, and that is marriage, but I speak of Christ and the church. The church is married to Christ. Verse 23 of Ephesians 5 tells us that he is the Savior of the body. Christ saves the body of Christ. You see that? And then he tells us, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church, and he gave himself for it. Christ loved the church, gave himself for it. Can we do less? Should we do less? Should we have the disposition that the church makes no difference whatsoever? That I have been saved by some inner working of the Spirit in my heart, and it has nothing to do with any church relationship where in the New Testament do we find that kind of terminology at all? We don't. It's not there at all. Now, I would like, in the second half of the lesson, only two parts of this lesson. That's great, isn't it? <laughs> but the, le the next portion breaks down to eight sub-points. So <laughs> but these are questions and or objections, and we'll note them very briefly. Questions and or objections. Now, well, I'll not take them right now live from the audience. We can do that, I suppose. But I will, I'm trying to summarize all that we've heard, all that I've heard through the years regarding questions and or objections to what we've laid out. Number one, people tell me, well, Christ saves us, not the church. Christ is the one who saves. The church doesn't save. Now, what about this? Let's go back in our minds and think about what was stated in the passage we just looked at in Ephesians chapter 5. He tells us Christ saves the body, 5 and 23. The body is the church. He saves the church. 
Then he tells us that Christ died for the church. Verse 25, he gave himself for it. Same thing we learned in Acts 20, 28. His blood was shed for the church. The church is an important institution. It's an essential institution. It is that which he saves. How is it then people come up and say, well, well, Christ saves you, not the church. Misunderstanding, you can feel it immediately that the ground upon which they're standing is shaky ground to say the least because they are assuming certain things to be the case which are not the case. And such as somehow that we're saying that the church is that which saves a person. That's not what we're saying. It is interesting though that we will give Christ the authority to tell us what we need to do to be saved, but people in the religious world will not give Christ the authority to tell us where we need to be. I would say this, if we give Christ all authority, and He has it, let's not only allow Him to have the authority to tell us what to do to become a Christian, but also where we need to be. That's the authority that we're talking about. But this objection is based upon a sour misunderstanding regarding the church, and it assumes that one is saved here at point A and joins a church later at point B. That's false misunderstanding, false understanding regarding the entire issue. Let's notice the next one. Why be contentious about it? Why would be contentious about which church to join, as they will put it? Why would we even contend about the matter? Let's just use this illustration. Let's just suppose that Noah building, you know, he's going to build an ark for 100 years. He's going to work on this ark. And he has his sons, and his sons are going to help him with it. And his sons say, you know, <clears throat> one of his sons, let's say one of them comes to him and says, look, I, I don't want to put my trust in the ark. I'm trusting God will save me. I don't trust the ark. Why should I put my trust in the ark? God saves me, and why, why would you be so contentious about it, Dad, to make me go into the ark? Because God's, I trust God. Now, what would you say to the son? Yes, okay, you trust in God. If you trust in God, why will we not trust what God says on the subject? Isn't that interesting? People say, I trust in God, but when we come to the text in which God tells them what to do, they reject it, they despise it, they say, no, I'm not going to do it. It's amazing to me. That's not trusting God. The same thing that Noah would say to his son. If you trust in God, you'll do what he says to do. And you'll be where he says to be. That's the answer, isn't it? That's exactly what the answer is here. Let's look at another one. Sometimes people say, well, God will not ask in the last day, how did you get here? Did you get by the church? Did you come by the church of Christ? Did you come by another church? How did you get into heaven? And we even hear jokes, people say, well, you know, there are many rooms in heaven and the Church of Christ people are in this room and they think they're the only ones here, let's be quiet, because we, they think they're the only ones up here. All of that, you, you've heard that, <clears throat> all of that once again is based upon a misunderstanding of what the Bible teaches regarding the church and what our stance is. Now let's think about this, let's just go back to the ark for a moment. Let's say that Noah and his family, eight souls were saved by water, 1 Peter 3 and verse 20. They come out. <clears throat> Do you suppose that God would say to Ham, Shem, or Japheth, and, well, how did you get here? Now, Noah came over the floodwaters and the ark, but how did you get here, Ham? Can you fathom such a question? No, that's silly. That's a silly question, because there's only one way, and that is in the ark. It's exactly the same thing regarding the church. There's only one church. God puts you in it, and if you're there, then you came by means of the church. That's it. It's the same as the ark. Truly, the objection is this. <clears throat> Baptism. Baptism for the remission of sins. Essential of salvation to put you into Christ. Galatians 3.27. That's the objective point that many people have. And I can illustrate it, we'll illustrate it this way. <clears throat> There's an older preacher in Arkansas, long since dead. He was probably in the 1940s and 50s, and he was a debater. Back then, of course, we debated. We had issues where we had discussions with denominational individuals about what the Bible teaches. And he would ask this question in debate. I was in northeast Arkansas for a while, and they still talk about Frank Gould is his name, Gould, G-O-U-L-E. Frank Gould, and he would ask this question in a debate. <clears throat> I found his tracks everywhere. He would say to the Baptist preacher, he said, all right, I want you to name one thing that is essential to salvation. 
that is found in the Baptist church that is not found anywhere else. One thing essential to salvation that is found in the Baptist church that is not found anywhere else. What do you think the answer was? Just as quiet as you are now. Nothing. Why? Because to get into any denomination, you must be baptized. And so if there's something essential in the Baptist church, and I speak, I'm speaking only in friendly terms. I want people to think about it. I'm not trying to be ugly. If I know my own heart, I don't want to be ugly about it at all. But if there's one thing essential in the Baptist church by which we must be saved, that is, we have to have that. It's only in the Baptist church, and you have to be baptized to get in there, then baptism is essential to salvation, isn't it? But that's what they strenuously object to. They don't want anything to do with baptism for the remission of sins as a door into Christ or as a door into the church. So they say there's nothing essential to salvation in any of these denominations. And all of them say the same thing. Well, if that be the case, if that be the case, then why be a part of any of them? That's exactly my plea as a religious person in a part of a religious community, and that is, Come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord. Touch no one unclean thing, and I will receive you. That is to say, be a part of the one body of Christ, the church. He saves it with his blood. Acts 20, verse 28. But it is baptism is that to which they object. And that's one of the main hang-ups with religious people today. I'll just add a little bit of history here. When Alexander Campbell began preaching in the 18 a second decade of the 1800s, and then he started the Christian Baptist paper, which was in 1823. Interesting background here. He thought that he would be preaching the pure gospel, faith, repentance, baptism, and he sent Walter Scott out preaching in the Western Reserve of Ohio, and <clears throat> there were scores, hundreds actually, of people who obeyed the gospel and wanted to be a part of that one church. And Campbell thought, you know what? It's very simple. Just lay it out. People will obey it. But when he did not really figure on, as far as I'm able to read in history, that so many people were so objective, objective case in the kickative mood about baptism for the remission of sins. And so that brought on several debates. And even though it was laid out simply and plainly as it is in the scripture, sectarian practitioners were absolutely adamant. Baptism has nothing to do with salvation. You can be saved before and without it. Belief only, and that's where they stood, and that's where they still stand. And that really has been the problem. So now let's think about a couple of other ideas. Some people say, have mentioned to me, well, how, how is Abraham saved? How is Moses saved? Well, Abraham and Moses were saved by being faithful to what God gave them to do. But this objection overlooks the fact that the Old Testament law is gone. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11 tells us very simply this. If there was perfection through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people has received the law, the law under the Levitical priesthood, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be reckoned after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change of the law. Is the law of Moses still valid? No, it is not. The change came when Christ nailed it to the cross, Colossians 2 and verse 14. No, people were saved by being faithful to what God gave them to do in the Old Testament. And people are saved today by being faithful to what God gives us to do under the new. And so even though Abraham and Moses were not baptized, they were faithful to what God told them to do. And we must do the same. Notice also people ask the question, how about infants? How can babies be saved? They're not part of the church. Infants are safe. They're not lost. The doctrine of hereditary total depravity is not taught in the scriptures. That is, people inherit Adam's sin. And our Lord makes it emphatically clear in two passages in Matthew. One is 18 and verse 14, where he says, Let the little children, actually this is 19 and 14, Let the little children come unto me, forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. You have to turn and become as a little child, Matthew 18 and 3, or you'll not get in. That shows us that children are safe, and we must become like little children if we're to think about entering. Children are not lost. 
And when they come to the age of accountability, when they understand what they have done and have gone into sin, then for the remission of sins, they're baptized into Christ. So infants are not lost. That's why they're not members of the church. How about this one? We've heard people say, well, <clears throat> this person was a good member of, or rather a good Christian, but is never a member of any church. You've heard that comment so many times. I've done scores and scores and scores of funerals through the years for members of the Lord's church and pe people outside. I've done some for babies. I've done some. And always, always I hear people say, well, he or she was a good Christian, but they were never a member of any church. Now that question and or objection is built upon, once again, the same faulty premises that we've seen throughout. How can one read Ephesians 5, which tells us that he saves the body, the church, verse 23, or that he gave himself for the church, he died for it, and he purchased it with his blood, Acts 20, verse 28, and that we're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 27, which is the same process by which we're baptized into his body, the church, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, and come away saying, well, I'm a good Christian. I'm not a member of any church. We're not reading our Bibles. That's what's happening. <laughs> That's what's happening. People are simply practicing popular religion. That's all that this matters. That's all that's taking place here. People are practicing popular religion, what they hear, what they hear a preacher say, what they hear someone say. And I challenge you to look at what the New Testament teaches. Don't take my word for anything. What does the New Testament teach? If I'm a miss, I'm happy to hear you on it. The way of salvation has been pointed out, and it includes, it involves being become a member of Christ, which is the same process by which you become a member of the church. That shows us in itself the importance of the church. Let's honor the church, not only with being members of it, but with attendance, with our support, with evangelism, supporting one another as Christians should. The lesson is yours if you want to respond to the invitation. While we stand and sing, come to the front right now.